Welcome to our lecture online. In this video, we're going to calculate the force between a small mass M and a disc. Now, this disc is flat and it has mass and it's turned perpendicular so that the plane or the perpendicular vector to the area of the disc points directly to the mass here. So if you can imagine this disc is turned like this, here's your mass right there. And what is the force of attraction, gravitational attraction between this mass right here and the mass here. Now we're going to call the mass of the big disc, big M, and the mass of this small mass here, small m. Now what we're doing here is we're taking a small little area element on the disc, we're going to call that dA, and we're going to use cylindrical coordinates so that the dA is equal to r dr d theta. The mass per unit area, we're going to call that rho, and it's going to be equal to the total mass of the disc divided by the total area, which is equal to mass divided by pi r squared, r being the radius of that circle or of that disc. And small r is going to be the variable which points from the center of the circle to any small area element on the disc. Now, if you take the geometry here from here to the center disc, let's call that distance a. Then the distance from the center to the area element is small r. And then this distance here, the hypotenuse, because this is a right angle right here. Let me draw that right angle. There is our right angle. Then you can see that this is then the hypotenuse, the square root of r squared plus a squared. The amount of mass that's contained within the small area element dm is simply equal to the mass per unit area times the area of the area element, which can be written as rho r dr d theta. And finally, the small amount of force experienced by this mass due to the small area element, let's call that a small df, but in the end, as we go all around the disk, the vertical components will cancel out and only the horizontal components will remain. So we actually want dfx, which is df times the cosine of phi, the phi being the angle between the distance from here to the center and the distance from there to the area element. Now notice that it's a different angle than the angle theta, which is a reference angle from the little area element to some reference line, and then we're going to integrate all the way around the disk. So if theta is going to be integrated from 0 to 2 pi all the way around the disk like that, and r will be integrated from 0 to the edge of the disk, which is big R. So now we're ready to go ahead and try to calculate the total force experienced by the small mass here, and we're going to start by the universal equation of gravity, that the small df is equal to g, times the product of the two masses divided by the distance between them squared. And of course, we're talking about this distance right here. And then realizing that dm can be written as, here we go, rho dA or rho r dr d theta. We can then say that this is equal to g m rho r dr d theta for the small element, mass element, divided by r squared plus a squared. And then one more thing, we don't want df, we want df in the x direction only, so we have to multiply times the cosine of phi, which is equal to the adjacent side a divided by the hypotenuse squared of r squared plus a squared. So then we write dfx is equal to df times the cosine of phi, which can be written as a divided by the square root of r squared plus a squared. So if we multiply this times this, we end up with g m rho r dr d theta and an a in the numerator divided by this multiplied times this, which gives us r squared plus a squared to the 3 halves power. So now we have, we're ready to go ahead and start integrating because we have the variable r we have dr and we have the variable d theta. So we can integrate over d theta and dr. So we can say that f in the x direction is simply equal to the double integral of dfx, which is equal to, now let's take all the constants and put them out, g, m, rho, r, and a. Nope, r is not a constant, that stays in. So we can write this as g, m, rho, and a times the double integral of r. I'm going to bring this to the numerator and call this r squared plus a squared to the three, oh, minus three halves power. We have a dr and a d theta, and d theta is going to be integrated from zero to two pi, and the r is going to be integrated from zero to big R, which is the radius of the disk. 
So we're about ready to integrate, but not quite, because if this is u, then d will be 2r dr. If we take the differential of what's inside the parentheses, we need a 2r dr, and we only have an r here. So we're going to multiply this times 2 and divide by 2. So that way we have a proper differential to integrate over dr. So when we integrate over d theta, that becomes theta. We're going to evaluate from 0 to 2 pi. So we end up at a 2 pi. And then we're going to integrate this. So this becomes equal to gm. Now instead of rho, we'll go back over here and realize that rho is equal to the total mass of the disk but, uh, divided by pi r squared. So we have big M divided by, we have a 2 here. So that's 2 pi r squared. So instead of rho, we have m over pi r squared. We still have the 2. And then we have this a right here. And now when we integrate d theta, that becomes theta. And we'll evaluate from 0 to 2 pi. So we still have to multiply this times 2 pi. That's when we integrate d theta, becomes theta. Evaluate from 0 to 2 pi, we get 2 pi. And then we're going to integrate this here. We have the proper differential, 2r dr. So this becomes the quantity, um, let's see here, that becomes r squared plus a squared to the minus one half power. We add one to the exponent and divide by the new exponent. And that's going to be evaluated from zero to r. So simplifying this a little bit, we have a two pi here and a two pi there. That's good. And now we're going to bring this over here. So this becomes equal to minus two, we have the minus, and divide by half, the same as multiply by 2, g m big M a over r squared. Now notice, if you ignore the minus 2 and the a right here, this is beginning to look like the equation of gravity. The 4 is due to gravity, where we multiply the two masses times g divided by r squared. But of course, since we have a disk, we're going to have some other factors. And now we're going to write this as 1 over the square root of r squared plus a squared evaluated from 0 to r. And now we can go ahead and plug in the upper limit and the lower limit and see what happens. So this is equal to minus 2gm big M over times a over r squared. And now when we plug in the upper limit, we get 1 over the square root of r squared plus a squared. And then when we plug in the lower limit, that's minus, plug in 0 there, we get 1 over the square root of a squared, or 1 over a. All right. So now, let's see here. Let's take a look. Let's take a look. Notice that the quantity a divided by r squared over a squared is equal to the cosine of the angle when we have the maximum when we have any angle phi but we have big R there that will be the maximum angle phi so we could say that the cosine of phi max is equal to a divided by the square root of r square plus a square so what we can do here is we could write this over a common denominator and also, when I think about it, notice that 1 over a has to be a bigger quantity than 1 over r squared plus a squared, because we have a bigger denominator. So if I change this to a negative and flip this around, I have a better thing to work with. So let's do that here. So I was going, I'm going to write this as a positive 2g little m big M a over r squared. And I'm going to move this around. So I'm going to write as 1 over a minus this, and then write over common denominator as well. So when I do that, so we have 1 over a minus 1 divided by the square root of r square plus a square. And I think rather than trying to write that as a over common denominator, I realized I have an a in here and I have 1 over a here. So I'm going to multiply this through and see what we end up. So when we multiply this into what we have in the brackets, we end up with 2 g m big M over r squared. So this is looking a lot like the universal equation of gravity that is equal to a divided by a gives me, whoop, 
at an equal sign, give me 1 minus a over the square root of r squared plus a squared. And now I realize I could replace this quantity here by the cosine of phi. So this can now be written as 2gm big M over r squared times 1 minus the cosine of phi. And of course, we're talking about phi max here. So I'll put a little m underneath there. Okay, looking at our trigonometry here, notice if I take this as the full distance r, if r here is this distance here when we have a maximum angle phi max, then I can write that the sine of phi max is equal to the opposite side over the hypotenuse, so it would be r divided by, uh, let's see, the square root of r squared plus a squared. And so r can be equal to the product of these two, and what I can do is, okay, so I'm looking at this right here, and I'm going to multi square both sides, so that means that this can now be written as r squared is equal to the sine square of phi times r squared plus a squared. And so since I have an r squared here, I'm going to replace that by this. So now the next step is this is equal to 2gm big M divided by the sine square of phi times r squared plus a squared. And then we still have times 1 minus the cosine of phi. And of course, this is max. That's the phi angle max. And now I realize that the sine square can be written as 1 minus the cosine square. And 1 minus the cosine square can be written as 1 minus the cosine times 1 plus the cosine. So this can now be written as follows. 2 times g m big M over r squared plus a squared, and I'm going to move this over here and write it as 1 minus the cosine of phi divided by 1 plus the cosine of phi times 1 minus the cosine of phi. So the sine square of phi can be written as 1 minus the cosine square of phi, which is a difference of squares, which can be written as this. That means that these can get cancelled out, and then put 1 over 1 plus the cosine of phi times 2 gmm over r squared plus a squared, and this then becomes the force of gravity experienced by the small mass here by being in the presence of this disk of mass. Now let's explore that answer just a little bit. First of all, you may wonder, well, why do I have a 2 here? But then I realize here that you have 1 plus the cosine of phi. Now what happens when phi becomes smaller? Let's say I make this this smaller. I don't change the mass. I keep the mass the same, but I distribute over a smaller, smaller, smaller disk. Eventually that angle goes to zero, and when the angle goes to zero, um, we have 1 plus the cosine of phi, that is 1 plus 1, which is 2, which will cancel out this 2 right here. So in the limit, as the disk becomes really small, I end up with gm big M over r squared plus a squared, which looks a lot more like our general equation of gravity. The second thing is, what about the a? What if a gets really large? Well, the larger a becomes, the less r squared makes a difference, right? If, that means if a becomes much, much larger than r, this then approaches a squared, which is simply the distance between m and the disk. And then again, notice, we then get the general equation of gravity as well. So either when the angle gets small or a gets very large, this equation will simply reduce to the universal equation of gravity. So it looks like we do have the correct equation that describes the force experienced by a small mass in the presence of a disk of mass of radius r. And that's how it's done.